Treatment of Lesbians in the Mental Health System in England in the 1950s. This is my friend's story told in her own words. It was 1953. I was a 17-year-old lesbian and had already spent 12 months of my life in an asylum. Reason? I was considered to be a sexual deviant, a moral danger to myself <clears throat> and others, regardless of the fact that many of the females who consorted with me were older women. That wasn't the issue, because anyway, most of them seemingly lived normal, narrow, hetero lives the Twin Set and Pearls Brigade. But I looked and acted how I felt. Butch. The first hospital wasn't too bad if you can forget that ward doors were locked, then locked a second time using the same lock and key. This was called check locked. I received a course of deep insulin treatment which was a massive injection of diabetic insulin, producing a diabetic coma. Then a tube was stuffed up my nose and a thick glucose mixture forced down the tube to bring me out of the coma. Often this induced a form of epileptic fit and I still don't know what the purpose was. I saw a doctor on admission and one other before my release. I worked on the hospital farm. That was quite pleasant. The payment for 40 hours work was a metal disc with two shillings, that's 10p nowadays, stamped on it. You could use that under supervision at the hospital shop. At the end of 12 months, my welfare officer, my trite heterosexual, God-fearing social worker found me lodgings with a nice, trite, heterosexual, God-fearing little family. Daddy, odd little mummy and two precocious little boys aged two and four years. My second period of incarceration lasted 18 months and was a nightmare. This came about because these secure, God-fearing people were afraid of my lesbianism. They never saw me with another woman, yet they were prejudiced. I didn't dress like a young woman should, their opinion. I smoked roll-ups. I didn't have a boyfriend. One day, I came back to my lodgings and was sitting in the kitchen. I became aware that the serving hatch between the kitchen and sitting room was half open. I also became very aware that I was being discussed by my landlady and a person just out of my line of vision. Talk about eavesdroppers never hearing good things about themselves. The conversation went something like this. <clears throat> She wears men's clothes. Oh. She sits around reading. She doesn't wear slippers. Aha. Uh -huh. You should read some of her letters and the ones she gets. Oh, yes. What sort? Well, hmm. Whisper, 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 whisper. Oh, dear. How dreadful. She can't stay here. I'm afraid for myself and the boys. They then realised that the hatch was open and yours truly was in the kitchen. Someone left the house and I was quite mystified, a bit angry, bemused. Who was it? Nausea crony. Anyway, it proved my private belongings were not safe from prying eyes. After about half an hour, I sensed someone standing behind me. On turning, I saw two policemen and my prized prat of a welfare officer. Oh shit, now what had I done? I was told to collect some things as I was being moved. 
There must have been an element of shock because I didn't ask where to. I knew why, and I didn't argue. Once on the street, it was a different story. Out there stood three cars and an ambulance. A police car, the social worker's car, and in the third sat two men. I was later informed that it was a doctor and a magistrate. They looked at me and inclined their heads in the direction of the ambulance. I'd just been declared morally insane and committed to yet another asylum. It now seemed quite incredible that two men, probably so-called respectable churchgoers and all that crap, could nod their wise old heads and take away someone's freedom. They didn't even speak one word to me. Have you all heard the expression, the men in white coats will take you away? Well, it's true. Years ago, this could happen. I wish there was a way of knowing how often this went on between, say, 1950 and 1960, and for what reasons. I was assisted none too gently into the ambulance, but then all hell was let loose. I was confronted with a straitjacket. All passivity flew out of the door, fists and feet suddenly had a life of their own. And the verbals, but you can't fight when the straps are pulled tight. By the time I entered the asylum, I was quiet. I think mainly due to the fact that I was knackered. I was quiet when they stripped off the, stra the straitjacket and my clothes. I was probably even quieter when the doctor asked me questions, making snide remarks regarding my sexuality and my friends. My pockets had little in them, some loose change. But then the nurse came up with a bonus. A tin of old Holborn and some papers. The expression on the doctor's face was pure glee. One would have thought they'd found at least a tin of opium. After a short period of non-communication, the doctor sent the nurse out to the office for something. He shouldn't have done this, and the nurse shouldn't have gone. But it was very obvious they both considered I was a lower than human order, and certainly not female. As soon as the nurse left, the doctor grabbed the front of my hair and my face came into violent contact with the metal bed frame. I had just time to hear him say, you are a fucking dirty little pervert, an expression I don't think I will ever be able to forget. Anyway, that was the last thing I heard or felt for a long time. Eventually I came round, only to find myself in a padded cell. This was common practice, to place newly committed lunatics in these, even when they were quiet. And was I quiet? My eyes were nearly closed, my front teeth were loose, and I thought my nose had been broken. It wasn't. But after four days, the blood which collected in the eyelids had to be removed by hypodermic syringe. The doctor said I'd fallen off the bed and landed on my face. Drugs were forced into people. Very often the amount depended not on a doctor but on a ward sister or, worse still, what is now called a charge nurse, who was usually male. Peraldehyde was a clear liquid medication in common use both as a medication and often as punishment. People given peraldehyde could be smelt 20 yards away, one good dose and it sweated out through the pores, pissed out and crapped out. It burned the mouth, throat and gut. 
I believe it has now been discontinued along with insulin, leukotomies and deep narcosis. ECT was given without anaesthetic and this was also used as punishment. Staff were often brutal and ignorant but I can remember a few who were dedicated and humane. Food was also very suspect. One either joked about it or pushed it down and kept a blank expression on one's face. Cockroaches in the mashed potatoes and I dare not think what may have been in the all too frequent stew or mince. I saw and heard many things in this hospital. Things it would be better to forget but I can't. Things which would have been more in keeping with Victorian or earlier times. Once I saw a young doctor who said to me, what do you think of a boy and girl who go into a field and have a good fuck? My answer was, what would you think? I was supposed to be a moral delinquent. But if a man said this to a young woman not in hospital, he would have been considered a pervert or a kink or just a dirty old man. Did their attitude stem from us being considered lunatics or because we were women? I do know there was some sexual exploitation of female inmates by at least one doctor and forced sex on females by porters and farm workers and even some male inmates, even though the sexes were segregated. After all, who would believe an inmate? Moreover, who would believe a woman? If pregnancy did occur, the woman often either, was either, either often too afraid to accuse or, after ECT and insulin, couldn't remember who'd abused her. I found out a lot about lesbian sex in both these hospitals, not just from young women like myself, but from one's keepers who exchange sex for even small favours like providing fresh eggs and things nicked from the hospital farms. I also learned how to tell lies to doctors, how to look them right in the eyes and say, yes, doctor. I don't really know what was wrong, but it's all right now. I feel much better and yes, I'd love to have a boyfriend husband and have children. In fact the lies became so fixed it was a form of self brainwashing and in the end it was impossible to separate the fantasy from fact. Much of what I've said will leave many questions unanswered but old unpleasant memories are painful to sift through. The most dreadful thought which will stay with me is that many young lesbians given so-called cures for their lesbianism never left these institutions. Many did become mindless due to experimentation with ECT, drugs, leucotomies and at a later period even LSD. Not long after this my friend was released she got married, saying that she'd been brainwashed in the lunar bin and had two children. The marriage lasted three years. She left her husband, telling him she was lesbian. She went to the National Assistance Board, who refused to help her and told her to go back to her husband. She developed pneumonia and her children were taken away. When she recovered, she couldn't get her children back because she was homeless. She thought that they were being taken care of and so went to London. She died in 2004.